All right, it's, it's kind of a longer chapter. There's a lot of stuff going on here. If you remember, just to get caught up to speed from last week, last week Joshua and the children of Israel, the elders of Israel, were deceived by the people of, of Gibeon. They had come in, they, they realized what had been done, they made it look like they were coming from a really far country, and they made a league or a pact with Israel that they wouldn't destroy them, that they would be, hey, if you get attacked, we'll defend you, and things like that. So in chapter 10, what happens here is that the other nations, the other kingdoms that are in this area, they hear what happened with Gibeon, and they're pretty upset by that. So they're saying, hey, let's go kill these guys because now they've joined up with Israel. Right now they're, now they're going to be with Israel and, uh, and they've, they've caused a lot of damage to the cause of everybody else. So you think about, they all know that Israel's coming through the land to, to take over and to conquer. They all know that. Now, if you just think about their self-interest, it makes sense that they'd be upset because every battle, at least humanly speaking, they're going to be thinking that, well, each battle should, should wear them down a little bit more. And they're, they're hoping that they're going to have the best chance when people are fighting against them to go and do that. So what this king does then is says, okay, we're going to teach Gibeon a lesson. Let's all join up together. They band together to go and fight against Gibeon just to wipe them out. Let's get started with some of these verses. Let's, let's start reading here in verse number one. The Bible says, Now it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and her king, so he had done to Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly. Now this is, they're getting scared again, just like, um, just like Ai was scared when they found out what happened to Jericho. The children of Israel continued to get these great victories over pretty solid cities. Pretty solid people, people who have defenses, people who have, you know, men of war residing in it, and they just continue to kind of roll over them. So they're getting more fearful. And they also, when he heard about what happened with Gibeon, that Gibeon backed down and basically surrendered themselves and sold themselves into slavery just to be spared their lives because they were afraid of what was going to happen because they didn't want to be destroyed. That put a lot of fear into this king of Jerusalem. And it, and it says there, they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city as one of the royal cities and because it was greater than Ai. So this was a bigger city. This is a, a much uh, more difficult city to have, to have fought against even than Ai was, yet they, they were still scared enough to just surrender right away. It says, and all the men thereof were mighty. So this was a city that was, it was a big city. It had a lot of people in it that were known for being mighty men of war, people that could fight, people that would be able to put up a fight against the children of Israel. But <coughs> when they heard that they had just given up, one, that puts fear in them, but two, then that makes them angry and wants to join up. And, and destroy these people. Look at verse number three. The Bible says, Wherefore Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent unto Hoam, king of Hebron, and unto Piram, king of Jarmuth, and unto Jephiah, king of Lachish, and unto Deber, king of Eglon, saying, Come up unto me and help me that we may smite Gibeon, for it hath made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. So they're upset. Now, isn't this exactly how the world works, though? Look at what happens, because what happened here is the people who are against God, the heathen of the land. We already have seen, I'm not going to cover that again, how in, in the law of Moses, they're explaining that, you know, the people of the land, the people of the land of Canaan, all of these different kingdoms, all these different cities, these people were involved in all manner of wickedness. These are God-hating people that are being judged and annihilated and wiped out according to God's will, because of their wickedness. So is it really a big surprise when they find out someone's making peace, right? They're, they're going to not be at war with the children of God. They're making peace with them, that that's going to make them livid, that that's going to make them angry, and they're going to want to turn around and devour one another as a result of anybody who's going to support a Bible-believing Christian. Isn't that what we're seeing today? from the God-haters, they'll all band together in unity against 
righteousness, against truth, against, against godly wisdom and godly preaching that's coming out. And you better believe anybody that's going to allow or make peace with the children of God, they're going to be attacked by the, by the gay mafia, right? By the, by the, the, the God-hating people of this world. They don't want to let that stand. It, it's happening. Think about even just, even just people who are just kind of out in the world, like the, like the Chick-fil-A's, right? Now, the Chick-fil-A isn't like some, you know, just these fire-breathing fundamentalists, you know, by any means. But what do they do? They're making peace with God's people by at least throwing a bone and, and kind of supporting anything that has to do with God and the Bible, and especially when it comes to just the most rudimentary, basic stuff. Elizabeth, pick that stuff up off the floor right now and throw it away. And don't do that anymore. All the most basic things, like, like the most vile wickedness, they're actually kind of, you're kind of sort of making a stand, right? And saying, no, we actually don't support this. And, and doing it, in, and I would say in a relatively mild manner, but look at all the, 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 the hatred and the vitriol that's coming against them. Why? Because they've made peace with the children of God on that issue. So they're all going to go after them and just, and just try to shut them down. Just like they do to anybody who's actually doing a work or fighting a, a, the spiritual battle and on the right side, they're going to go after those people. But then they'll also go after the people who maybe, they may not even be fighting in the battle, but they're just kind of siding with the people who are fighting that battle. They're just in peace with them. They're at agreement with them. Oh, we'll let them do business. Because what you see happening now is that these, these, these God-hating sodomites, see, it's not enough for them to be, to be uh, just accepted or tolerated. They're going to keep pushing the envelope more and more and more. And I'm not going to get too far into this because I'm preaching on this on Sunday. But um, they don't want to get, as soon, as soon as they find out that there's somebody even doing business with them, they're going to go after that business and try to get them shut down. Say, oh, you're going to make peace with them? And then they've done this with all the payment processors, the PayPals, the GayPals, the, you know, all the, all the different um, whoever's allowing for, for charitable giving to be done to churches that preach God's word. They already are attacking the churches, but now they start going after the other businesses saying, well, we'll shut you down. And they're going to go and, and try to destroy anybody that's going to have anything to do. Oh, you, these, these people are going and doing a soul winning marathon. They're going to go out and preach, preach the word of God. These hateful people. And they find out, oh, you're going to be at this restaurant. Oh, you're going to have a conference at this hotel. And what do they do? They, they call up and they do whatever they can to try to attack then whoever is just at peace with, with doing the work of the Lord. There's nothing new under the sun. That's how they operate. Oh, wait, but we're the hateful ones, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's exactly what we see happening here. These wicked reprobates now are going to devour and destroy basically one of their own just because they made peace because they didn't want to get destroyed. Now they're just like, well, we're going to destroy you then. So they come after them. But this also illustrates... You know, I brought it up last week. I'm not going to go too far into it today, but how the, you know, making the league, the children of Israel making a league and making this covenant and making this pact where, oh yeah, we'll defend each other. See how stupid that was now? Because now the, the people of Gibeon are being attacked and guess who has to go support them? Israel does. It's not their fight. It's not their battle, but they made it their battle because they made this stupid alliance and agreement with them that they would go and fight for them. And they have to now spend their resources, risk their lives, risk the lives of their children to go out there and to fight this battle just because they made this agreement, which ultimately really has nothing. I mean, it has to do with them, but it, but it wasn't their fight. And, um, you know, this is why I believe that, that no country should be getting involved in these types of alliances. You should just be able to rely on the Lord and just say, the Lord's our strength. That's the type of country I'd like to live in at least. But um, let's keep reading here. Verse number five. So therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up. 
they and all their hosts, and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp to Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants, come up to us quickly, and save us and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So they send for him, said, Hey, you guys made an agreement, come up now, we need your help. And now they have to, now they have to fight with, like, with the heathen. They're fighting against the heathen, but they're kind of taking the side of the heathen, and it's, you know, it's just a big mess. But, uh, but God still decides to use them. God still gives them, and I think he does this for a couple of different reasons, but if you remember in the previous chapter, the children of Israel, by and large, were really upset that the elders, that the, that the leaders had been duped and made that alliance, and they were really upset about it, and that kind of even made, I think, Joshua's um, authority maybe be, be diminished a little bit because of that, because it was, it was such a blunder that people might have been um, very upset by that. And if God had allowed them to, and, and God would have been just in allowing them to reap what they've sown by making such a stupid thing and, and you know, lose a bunch of people and be defeated and stuff. But he chose not to do that. And I think one of the reasons was to still continue to secure Joshua because it wasn't something that was just so so bad that he had, you know, that he couldn't do any work for the Lord anymore. God still wanted to use him. He still had a plan. He still had an agenda. He made a mistake. He realized what he had done, and, and they still were, were doing the, the most right thing they could do, even though they made that mistake, and, and were keeping their word, and they were going to keep their vow and not break their vow that they made before the Lord, and, and I think God gave them credit for that, for that much then to still support them and just continue to fight these battles. And also these people were people that needed to be exterminated anyways. They were still part of the plan of, of going in and, and destroying them. So God's with them. It says in verse number seven, it says, so Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. So it's kind of interesting here. You see, Joshua goes anyways because he has to keep his word. Now, normally Joshua, I think, would be inquiring of the Lord first. But th at this point, he, I mean, he has to go. But God still gives him word and says, you know what? Don't be afraid of him. Don't worry. I, I, I'm going to take care of you, Joshua. I, I've delivered them into your hands. So when he hears that, that, I think, that really invigorates Joshua to now be kind of wholehearted back into this fight because I think before he might have been going up there reluctantly just because he had to. Now look what it says in verse number 9. Joshua, therefore, so after the Lord said he's delivered him, Joshua, therefore, came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. So he's like, oh, okay, God's with us? Well, let's go do this then. Right? And he's like, he's like we're, we're on the road. We're going to go from Gilgal. We're going to travel all night. We're going to start fighting. And as he continues to the fight, there's this awesome miracle that he does where he just extends it even more. He's like, sun, stand still. Moon, you stay there. And we're, you know, we're not done with this. We got too much work to be done in the day. And I can't let this day end right here. We need to keep fighting. And it's an awesome. I love this story. This is so cool because I, I don't know how many times I feel like, man, there's just like not enough time to get everything done in a day. And I'm sure that's how Joshua was feeling. And he, man, he was so on fire to fight these battles. He's just like, no, we ain't stopping. Let's keep going. Keep fighting. And what a, what a great story. Let's keep reading here. I don't want to get too far ahead because that's coming up in the next few verses. Verse number 10. And the Lord discomforted them. But this is the other thing we have to keep in mind too. That, he, that, that God said he's going to be with them. But God makes dead sure that he gets all of the credit and glory for this battle and for this fight. I mean, between that miracle I just mentioned of the, of the, the sun being standing still and kind of time stopping for him. In order to do this, then we're also going to see with the, with the hailstones that, that God gets the credit and the glory for, for this uh, battle, for this defeat. It's not by the might of Joshua that these people are all destroyed. It's by the power of God. Verse number 10, And the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horon and smote them to Ezekiah and unto Makeda. What an awesome victory. Verse number 11, And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Horon that the Lord 
cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Ezekiel, and they died. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. So God's making sure he's getting the credit for this so much that not only is he, you know, they've got the fear of Israel in them already. They're fighting against them. They're beating them. They're chasing after them. You know, they're, they're fleeing away and they're still pursuing them and, and, and defeating them. And however many people they'd already killed and destroyed with the sword just in battle and just fighting them and beating them, as these people run away, God has his great hailstorm. Now, I don't know, it doesn't tell us how big the hail was, but it was killing him. I mean, imagine what that, what that must have been like. It, this isn't your, your little hail that's, that's killing these people. These got to be some massive hailstones. Now, that doesn't just happen regularly. You know, it's pretty, pretty rare when you get those big, like, soccer ball size hail or whatever coming down. I mean... You got to search and try to find that stuff on the internet these days just to see whenever anything like that even comes close to it. You see, you see like softball size. But this stuff, I mean, it, this had to have been really big hail in order to kill these people and in order to kill more than they had killed in the battle. And there's no other explanation for this. And it doesn't say that the children of Israel were killed when they were following them. God killed more of them than, than they had even, than had even died in the battle. God gets the credit and the glory. <laughs> And all the honor for this victory. What, it, what an awesome victory it is. Let's keep reading here, verse number 12. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said, In the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Aijalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. So Joshua gathered an entire extra day out of this battle. I mean, one, I can't see at the end of a day of fighting and pursuing why you'd want to keep fighting for a whole other day. I mean, I get it. I know why, right? And, and that's, that's the great, um, the zeal that he had and, and what we should want to have rub off on us because fighting in a battle makes you weary. I, I mean, I don't know if you've ladies ever done this, but guys, probably everyone here, I would imagine, has, has done some form of fighting, one level or another, wrestling, you know, any type of fighting at all, even if it's not a street fight, but I mean, but just anything that you do like that, you do martial arts or something, you get, you get tired fast. You get tired real fast. Imagine fighting for your life with weapons, maybe, you know, with armor, with swords. I mean, that's a, <laughs> that's, that's a serious workout. It's a, that, that's a lot of, of strength being drained. I mean, at the end of the day, you're probably thinking like, all right, man, let's, you know, yeah, you know, you're, you're excited, you're pumped up, you're winning the battle, but it's like, you got to be getting tired. And, and Joshua's just like, no, we're going to finish this fight. We're going to keep going. Son, we've got too much to do. You know, you stay right there. You stay put. We're going to finish this battle. And they did it. And, and their heart was right and they were zealous and moving forward. What, what, a great, what a great leader to even come into his heart. And that's what's cool about the way that God works. God didn't tell him to do that. But that came into Joshua's heart to serve the Lord fervently. And he's the one that asked God for that to be done and God listened to him. He wasn't commanded to tell the, the son to stand still. God wasn't requiring of him to continue fighting for a whole nother day back to back. But it was in his heart to do so and God, and God liked that. And, and God did that for him. And we got to keep that in mind. Now, Look, we're not seeing these, these awesome miracles done on a daily basis. It's not happening. It didn't happen in Bible times. We get to read these cool stories because it is unique. It is different. But we also have to remember that, that God is still just as powerful today as he ever has been. And especially as I personally believe we're heading into the end times really quickly, I think that the end times of all times is going to be a time where there's going to be 
a little bit more of God's power being demonstrated through people who are really on fire and fervent and fighting in that spiritual fight. And as people are being martyred and serving the Lord, I think we're going to see a resurgence of some of the things of God using people to do these great type of acts and doing these, these great types of things. I, I wholeheartedly believe that. I don't see why it wouldn't be like that. Pretty exciting. Pretty exciting just to think about that. Now, there's a couple of things here that I actually want to spend kind of the most of the, re of the rest of the time on. Uh, we're, we'll go over the rest of the chapter when I get through these two subjects. But for the rest of the chapter, basically, after they, um, they all, all go on the run, you know, the five kings hide themselves and they, they lock them up in a cave until they're done pursuing after their enemies. They kill the, they, they come back, they, they kill the kings which I said, well, we'll read that. And then he goes back and goes to each one of those cities of the kings and destroys each one of those cities before they finally end up going back home. But uh, there's two things that are mentioned here that I want to go over. The first one is, it says in verse number 13, when it talks about what happened with the sun standing still, the moon staying, it says, is not this written in the book of Jasher? Now, there are multiple references in the Bible of other books that are not a book of the Bible being referenced uh, and, and people unfortunately it's a stumbling stone for some people because they start to say well what is this book of Jasher? now there's nothing wrong with this question hey well what is the book of Jasher? I don't know but I'll tell you one thing right off the bat it's not scripture it's not if it were it would be in God's word and it's not there and it hasn't been preserved and the book of Jasher there's no evidence to say it has survived the test of time it's a, it's a lost book it is a real book that was around during this time when Joshua was doing these battles. It was a real book. The Bible, see, the Bible makes reference, references to other people, to other literature, to things that someone might have said, but that doesn't make that source Scripture or God's Word. He's just saying, look, all this happened, and this is such an incredible event. You know, Joshua is saying, well, you don't have to just take my word for it. It's also in this book, right? It's also found in the book of Jasher, right? These things really happen. This is recorded. Now, the best of my understanding, because the book of Jasher is mentioned twice in the Bible, it appears to me just to be some book of records of like military battles or expeditions or something like that. It seems to have to do with military stuff because the other place it's mentioned is in 2 Samuel chapter 1. I'll just read this for you. 2 Samuel 1, 17, the Bible says, And David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan his son when, when Saul and Jonathan died in the battle. And verse number 18 says, Also he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Colon, behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. So the use of the bow, I right? said so it's a military thing, a military exercise, or teaching or training about the use of the bow. So you have this book of Jasher has something like that. It also has the recording of Joshua in this great battle and the sun and mood standing still. So that's what we have from Scripture. And you know what? That's all we need. Because God's given us all we need to know. But see, Satan knows that there are a lot of people that that won't be good enough for. And they're going to go and, and some, he, he's allowed someone to go and make up forgeries. And see, this is, this is where it's the con man is great at their game. Con man knows there's no book of Jasher. So I'm going to capitalize on this. Because you could just go backwards and say, well, what is the Bible reference that, that we don't really know about today? Oh, there we go. Now you could come up with anything you want. Anything you want. You could put it in this book and say, oh, this is, this is the book of Jasher. Hey, look what, look what we've uncovered under this rock in this cave in the Middle East. Look, oh, <laughs> it's the book of Jasher. It survived all these years. We've got it. And even if it is like, like somewhat older, you know, you find some older manuscript that, that wasn't just planted there because people, people have been already known to fake stuff like this. Someone just did it then, right? Maybe the Bible wasn't, you know, the writing wasn't 4,000 years old at the time. It was only 1,000 years old and they, and they did the same exact con game of writing this book of Jasher. 
It's very, it's very reasonable. And it's, that's actually the case of what happened here. I actually went and looked up the book of Jasher and started reading it just to see what it's all about. Because there is a book of Jasher that exists. But the book of Jasher, this is one of the books that's, that's even, even online, I don't know if there's anyone who tries to teach that this is actually like, sh should be the word of God. But you also have those people too that say, oh, well, how do you know that this is in scripture, right? And people say, well, so you're just trusting this council of Nicaea from, you know, 300 AD that they, they're the ones that gave you your Bible. You just trust the Catholics. They gave you your Bible. No, dummy. I'm not trusting the Catholics that gave me the Bible. We're trusting that the churches that were valid New Testament churches knew what the scriptures were and they continued to share the epistles and pass that down throughout the centuries. Now, it just so happened to be that there was a council where, where people were trying to determine what were they going to believe. But that's what it was. As a, as a council of people were deciding what were they going to believe? What were they going to assume and what were they going to choose? But that doesn't mean that just because that, that they said it, that that's why it stands. There's a lot more to it than just some group of people sitting around a table. And it's actually very easy to tell, specifically in this book of Jeshua. I, started, I read like the first, I don't know, seven chapters or something. And <laughs> like all of the frauds, they're so easy to spot. The more you read the Bible... The, so much easier it is to identify the fraud. And you know, that's actually, that's, that's how people work in fraud departments, like people who are looking to, to, to find counterfeit money. It's people who have studied real money just in, they just study that and study. They don't have to go out and learn all the different frauds. They just have to know the real thing inside and out. And then when they see something that doesn't match, it's, oh, it's, okay, yeah, that's, that's the fraud right there. There's a counterfeit. There's a counterfeit. Why? Because they know the real one so well. And when you know the real, when you know God's word really well, these frauds just stand out like a sore thumb. But what they do is they try to use biblical type language. Like the Book of Mormon, right? There's a fraud for you. Uh, any of these. And, and what's common, I think, between all of them, and I'm not an expert in all these different languages, but you know what? I have read this book quite a bit. And apart from maybe Deuteronomy or First and Second Chronicles, you don't have repeats of stories like, like just being told. Like, you know, we don't have a repeat of Genesis in the Bible. And even those books I mentioned, they're not total repeats either. So if you compare 1 and 2 Kings with 1 and 2 Chronicles, they're different sources of the same events, but from slightly different perspectives, and they give you different information, but they're both written as scripture that you could tell the, the, the style of the Holy Ghost, to let alone the, the, the writers. And um, what this book of Jasher does, almost the, the whole book, all it covers in content is the first five books of Moses and the book of Joshua. And that's where it ends. And that's where it stops. So it goes through everything already. It's like, why would that be scripture? God already gave us the first five books of Moses and the book of Joshua. Like we already have that. We don't need it again. And a lot of it literally is just repeating Almost word for word. I didn't do a full-on study of doing, is it word for word, but just reading it and knowing the stories and knowing my own, just like, yeah, it says that, 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 that. And why does it do that? Because it wants to build credibility. But then what it does is it just inserts the creativity or imagination of whoever is writing it to just add whatever details they want in whatever areas they want to. So they, there, there's some story, stories in the Bible and they just decide to just start adding their own spin and adding their own twist and saying, oh, here's the parts that you didn't know, kind of like behind the scenes, right? Here's, here's all that extra information that you wanted to know that's not recorded for us in Scripture, but here it is anyways. It's all for you. And then you get the, the online sleuths, right? The, the people who are too smart for any church. Oh, 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 oh yeah. I know so much more than all these churches. The people that want to go back and correct the Bible, and they're these language experts on Hebrew and Greek, and they don't even know the alphabet. 
but, but they know how to use a, a dictionary and they think that that makes them experts in translation because they go to a dictionary, oh, well, did you know that this word means this and, and, and also this? And you can look at the sixth definition of this word and it also means this. I actually had somebody when I was out sewing, like this person just pops in my head because it's the stereotypical of what I'm, what I'm describing here. And there's way more out there like him. And I was trying, I was going soul winning. I was trying to get the guy saved, right? He invites me into his house. So, okay. And, and I, I, I was probably still a little bit foolish because I spent more time with him than I should have. But, but so, you know, sometimes I try to, you know, if he, he was listening a little bit, I was trying to answer some of his questions and then get back to the gospel. Okay, here's what one of the things he said before I just had to shut him down and be like, I'm out of here. Because he already made a comment like, oh, I've been to all the churches here and, you know, he's, he's too smart for all of them. He's lifted up in pride. But he was trying to tell me that when the serpent beguiled Eve, he's like, well, what does that mean? I'm like, he tricked her. Because that's what the word beguile means. He said, like, but if you go to the Hebrew and if you look at the word beguile, it's actually what, you know, whatever word it is. You know, it's, Look at, look at this. Here, I'll show you. Let me see. I'm like, whatever, you know. And it's like the fourth definition. And, and he's going into this as, as if it's like a, um, seducing. So you see, see, beguile could mean seduce. This word means seduce. And, he, and, and if you're familiar with it, he gets into this serpent seed doctrine that basically, what, what it is, it's, it's ridiculous. And I think someone on drugs came up with it because... Uh, it's bizarre. You can't just get that from reading the Bible. But when it says that the serpent beguiled Eve, what they think is that, is that Satan like laid in the carnal sense with Eve and, and made her pregnant. And she had another child that was just of the devil, right? So you have like Cain was of the devil. It says he was of that wicked one. We understand that when someone's a child of the devil, it's talking about they're, you know, spiritually, they're born, you know, like we're born again, children of God. Well, they're born children of the devil. It's a very simple concept to understand. Well, they think that there's people out there that are literal, like physical, seed of Satan. So we call it the serpent seed. And it's, it's, it's a ridiculous doctrine. But, you know, but he had to go to go back and say, see, beguile means seduce. And so seduce, we all know me. And look, even the word seduce doesn't have to be in that type of a context of being something that has to do with the bedroom. You could seduce someone with anything. It's just another word for deceive or beguile. Like, it's a synonym. Okay, so what? But they want to be, feel so smart that they know this hidden knowledge. Ha oh, ha, I figured it out. They want to be the ones that have solved the puzzle. Wow, I've got, I've got this new information and this new doctrine and this new understanding that no one's known before. I figure I unlocked the Bible. I unlocked the real. Do you know what the Bible really means? You know what that word beguile really means? Like, watch out for these people. Don't get sucked into that nonsense. Some people get sucked into the Pentecostalism of all the emotion. Woo! Just, they feel like, oh, that's the Holy Spirit with all this craziness going on. Other people go with the intellectual side and say, oh, man, no. No, see, you don't understand. I mean, this is a deep book and, and there's so much hidden here and, and you don't even know the half of it and you guys are so stupid. You, just, you need to really just study this book. And, that, and that's how they try to get people. And a lot of people fall for that. And you know who falls for that? Mostly the people who are lifted up in pride. They can't be told that they're wrong. They can't just accept the book for what it says and what it says on the surface very plainly. They have to go and, and come up with all these weird new doctrines. Watch out for people that are coming up with new doctrines. And I'll get to this in just a minute, but watch out for the, there's that, uh, what, what's the name of that church? Is it uh, Harvest, the one in New York? Doka? That's the, the Flat Earther? Great Harvest Baptist Church? Watch out for those guys. You know, I've reserved passing judgment for a long time. Because I don't, I don't like to do it. For one, I just, you know, I, I like to just wait and I don't always have a lot of information on stuff that happens online. So I just, I just hold my peace. But there was something that didn't feel right from the, from the, moment, from the moment I met him. And uh, then he comes out with all this flat earth stuff and believe it or not, yeah, we're getting into that in just a minute. Because that's coming next.
But I just found out from these guys over there, I just started listening to part of the sermon today that they're saying that, oh yeah, do you know that, that not every believer is a saint? That's their new doctrine. They're denying the sainthood of the believer. No, no, you have to be really good. And, and he, the, the guy is so proud. It's their evangelist teaching this. And before he got up and taught, Doga sat up. He's like, I just want you guys to know that I already know what he's going to teach. I know what he believes about this. He's talked to me about it. And I, and I'm, I agree with, with what he's teaching. So he gave his full endorsement. It's not like he didn't know what was going to be going on. He's like, nope, this is right. And the guy preaching was like, was, was even saying that like this is new. Oh, yeah, but it's so clear. And you look at this, look at this. And everything he said is so easily refutable. He's like, if you even, have, if you even think you know 95% that this is right, you know, and there's something to write in the Bible, but you don't know for sure, he's like, you shouldn't preach on it. And he's like, man, I just, this is just so solid. And I'm just thinking like, face palm. Like all of your examples are stupid. All of them. They don't hold any water. They're, they're just, they're full of logical fallacies. But it doesn't surprise me that people that fall for the earth being flat don't have very good reasoning and logic skills when it comes to understanding Scripture. It, it's not a big surprise at all because they look like fools, because they are fools. And to come out with this doctor and say, oh, this is a new doctor. No, it's not new. The Catholics believe that. The Catholics believe that, only saint, that, that there's only certain people that are saints, and the people who are really, really good, they become saints, and they achieve sainthood. It's a Catholic doctrine. It's been around forever. But you know what it hasn't been? Yeah, it's new to a Baptist, because no Baptists believe that. That's right. But this shows you the path that they're on. They want to come out with all this new stuff and this new wisdom. And it wouldn't surprise me if they believe in the Nephilim and the, you know, the, the, these giants. And we'll get into that in a minute, too, because that's part of <laughs> what we're covering. And, and, you know, and all of this hidden wisdom, you know what that is? It's occultism. When they start coming at you with all this hidden stuff in the Bible, the occult means it's, it's hidden wisdom. That's what they're all about. They're all about the stuff that's kept from the public in general, but it's this, this knowledge. You know, and, and they, people in the occult don't view the occult as being bad. They just view it as, as them having more knowledge than everybody else. And they'll even justify and say, well, the common people aren't ready for this type of, of knowledge and information. So it needs to be withheld for them, for their own good. That's what a lot of them will, will say to themselves. But anyways, I don't want to get too far off into that. Book of Jasher. I'm just going to read for you. It, it's evident when you read this stuff, it's nonsense. It is not of God. It's very clear. I have a, a copy here from the, the fraudulent book of Jasher. And even this one, it's like this book came out in like the 1800s or something. So it's, it's just total fraud. And, and I don't know if there's anyone out there that actually buys into like the book of Jasher. So-called someone, uh, there's so many people out there, I'm sure there's probably someone that is, but um, even online, you're going to see why, by and large, that this is just a kind of a fraudulent book. But uh, here's a couple verses from that book. It says, And when they were smiting, the day was declining toward evening, and Joshua said in the sight of all the people, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon, until the nation shall have revenged itself upon its enemies. So you see, this is the same story that we're reading about, and you'll see that they're using almost the same exact language, and they try to put their sentences together to flow the same way that the King James Bible reads, but they can never do it because it never sounds quite as awesome as the King James is because the King James is a word of God. So even when they're trying to mimic and imitate God's word, it still falls short. It still lacks the power. It lacks the, you know, just the beauty and everything of the language. And then it says in the next verse, it says, And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Joshua, and the sun stood still in the midst of the heavens. And it stood still six and thirty moments. And the moon also stood still and hastened not to go down a whole day. Six and thirty moments? First of all, what's a moment? What's 36 of them? Is it, is it 36 minutes? Is it 36 hours? No. The sun and the moon were out at the same time. It says they, they, they had them both stand still for a day. 
That's what happened. That's what the Bible says. So you want to know how we could prove the book of Jasher is a false book? Just from this one verse right here. There's a contradiction. Guess what, book of Jasher? You're out. I don't even need to read any of the other 80 chapters or however many there are to cover all the events of the Old Testament that we already have. Don't go looking for extra, oh, I just want, I just want to know this, this extra little bit of information that the Bible doesn't give me. Well, if it's not there, you don't need it. Don't go conjuring up anything to insert into God's Word. Because you insert into God's Word, you're going to be found a liar. Another book that, that's actually way more common and popularly referenced is the so-called book of Enoch. Now again, this is where the fraudsters will come in, the con men. They see when the Bible references in the New Testament it talks about what Enoch said, right, in the book of Jude. And it quotes Enoch. So then you get someone thinking, saying, well, how could, how could Jude so many years later quote Enoch? How could he do that? It must have been written down in a book in order for him to quote Enoch, right? That's what they did. So, so let's make a book of Enoch. The problem is that Enoch was taken before the flood. So they have to come up with some crazy story. Well, well Noah had it with them in the, in the ark and all, you know, this, this book of Enoch, transfer it, trade it, hand. They have this whole story. I was reading a little bit on this online. I'm like, where do you get this stuff from? You're just making it up. You have no, you have no evidence at all. They're saying, well, you see, Enoch gave it to Methuselah, and Methuselah died right at the same year of the flood. Methuselah gave it to Noah, and Noah had it. And then um, it goes, and, and, and they say it goes down to Ham, and Ham stole it from his father. And then it goes, you know, it's like, where do you get this stuff from? There's no evidence for that at all. There's making stuff up. But people eat it up because it's a story and going, oh, no one else knows this. Did you know? And then you want to sound all smart and say, you haven't read the book of Enoch? <sighs> well, I mean, it's ancient literature. I mean, you don't know this. I mean, you're a student of the Bible and you don't know the book of Enoch. And, and you know, don't fall for that stuff. And someone who's lifted up with pride will try to talk down to you about that. And then, you know, and then, and then Christians might go, oh, I need, to, I, I need to know what that says. I need to figure that out then. Because you feel like, like you're being put to shame. But don't, don't, don't fall for that nonsense. In chapter 7, and this is where the people that get all caught up in this Nephilim stuff. And they want to sound all fan, oh, the Nephilim. The, no, don't you know the Nephilim? The Nephilim, yeah, there's a Nephilim. Well, the Bible says giants. Because that's what they were. There were giants in the land in those days. Actually, let's turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 6, real quick. In case you don't know what the Bible says, because this is the passage they all love to just, just totally pervert and destroy with their weird, strange doctrines and fables. Jewish fables is what they are. Leave her alone. The reason why they use the word Nephilim is because that's just the Hebrew word. <laughs> it's all it is. And you know what it means? Giants. But if you want to sound real smart, you'll use a word from another language that there's no reason anyone even should know what that word is because it's in an, in an old Hebrew language. And we have the word in English already translated for us. But in order to make yourself sound really smart, you'll use that other word. And you'll transliterate it instead of translate it like the King James Bible translators did because that's all it means, giants. So Genesis chapter 6, it says, verse number 1, And it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh. Yet his days shall be in 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. 
And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And repented the Lord, he made him. And he said, basically, I'm going to destroy him, I'm going to send a flood, and that's what happens, right? Very simple passage to understand. Until you get someone that wants to turn your head around about this stuff, and they start feeding you this perverted understanding, saying, well, do you know when it says the sons of God saw the daughters of men? Why is it saying daughters of men and sons of God? You know why? Because those are angels. Angels. Yeah, angels. The angels married these women. And that's why they were such great, powerful people in the earth. Because the, they're angelic. They were supernatural beings. And they had these superpowers and whatever. And they were the giants. But when we read the scripture... First of all, it doesn't say angels anywhere. Yeah, you, you have a real hard time proving that sons of God are angels when the Bible always refers to sons of God as being believers. Now, I'm not going to go in fully and prove all this, but we can just see right here. Look, what does it say in verse number four? It says there were giants in the earth in those days. In what days? The days that we're talking about here. There were giants in the earth. And also, wait, after that, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also, after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, they bare children to them. So, doesn't it sound like the giants were already there before the sons of God went in unto the daughters of men? Just from reading Scripture, like just, just reading it for what it says? Because that's what it sounds like to me. Because the, 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 the sons of God that came in under the daughters of men and they bare children to them, they became mighty men of renown. When these, these saved men married these unsaved women and the women were raising their children, they raised them up to be prideful and to be these, these men of renown and seeking glory and seeking their own profit and everything else. And they became these mighty men of renown. But, oh, but that doesn't sound as romantic as the, you know, these angels. That doesn't sound as cool and as hidden knowledge of these angels coming down and doing this. Well, but you know where they get, they don't, they don't just come up with this stuff all on their own. They go to these extra biblical resources to find this type of information. I'll read from you from the book of Enoch, the supposed book of Enoch, and the giants, so in their chapter 7, it says, And all the others together with them took unto themselves wives. This is talking about this, that it has these names and stuff for all these, these demons, right? Or angels, or whatever you want to call them. That they made this pact that they're going to go in because they were lusting after these women and they wanted to take wives to themselves. So they, they wanted these women, so they make this pact that they're all going to go do it together. Because the one guy is saying, well, you can't just send me to do it because then, then you guys are going to back, back off and not actually do it, and then I'm going to get all the blame for this. And they're like, no, 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 we'll go, we'll go do it with you. We'll all do this as, as a group. So they, they get together, it says, and they, all the others together with them took unto themselves wives, and each chose for himself one, and they began to go in unto them and to defile themselves with them, and they taught them charms and enchantments and the cutting of roots and made them acquainted with plants. So here's the stuff where you get this, this demonic knowledge concept from. Well, the demons are giving them all this information. They're telling them to do all this enchantments and witchness, witchcraft and all this other stuff. And they became pregnant and they bear great giants. And do you want to know how we know that the book of Enoch also is a false book. It's actually very easy. Besides the fact that you could go in and find the contradictions of God's word, listen to this. It says, whose height was 3,000 L's. Now, you probably don't know what an L is. I didn't either. But I looked up the unit of measure for an L. 3,000 L's is 11,250 feet. feet. 11,250 feet tall. It's saying that these giants were 11,250 feet tall. Now, do you know how tall it is? That's taller than Stone Mountain. That's like three times the size of the tallest building in the world. That's almost half the size of Mount Everest. 
and that they had these giants. You know how big their head would be? Like seriously, I looked this up, okay, because I wanted to see what the proportions were. It wasn't just enough for me to, to, to say how ridiculous it is to say that they're 11,000 feet tall. Their head is 1,500 feet. It would have to be 1,500 big to be in proportion to the rest of their body. Their head. Now, I wasn't able to find how big their teeth would be. But I mean, if your head is 1,500 feet tall, I mean, think about it. Your head might be, what, about a foot tall, roughly, right? Your average head size for an adult. Well, their head was 1,500 feet. So 1,500 times the size of your tooth, like that, that's what their tooth was, according to this book. How does anyone take this seriously? I also figured out what their weight would have to be, if their, their ideal weight, because there's calculators out there what your ideal, your optimum weight should be for a 25-year-old giant that's 11,000 feet tall. Do you know what his, 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 his ideal weight would be? Now, it's different because there's different formulas. So there's a range. And forgive me for, the, for, the, for the, how wide this range is because when you start getting real big numbers, then it makes the range like really big. Their ideal body weight would be between 420,000 pounds and 800,000 pounds. They're giants. And they're 800,000 pounds and 125,000 feet tall, or 11,250 feet tall. Now, we know, like, I believe that dinosaurs were real, that they were great lizards, right? And we see skeletal structures of, of, of animals that existed that were that big. And we even actually see some fossilized footprints and things like that from great beasts, right? They didn't weigh 800,000 pounds, though. What type of footprints would you see from a creature that's walking on the earth that's half the size of Mount Everest <laughs> that weighs 800,000 pounds? That, I mean, I mean what, what would be this? Oh, that would be good. See the size of their foot. Because where are you going to walk? But see, no one thinks about these things. What are they going to eat? <laughs> How are you going to feed a belly that's that big? Like there's not enough food on the planet. I mean, we think we have problems with food now, right? There's six billion people. On. What about one giant? That's 11,000 feet tall. How fast would he have to grow? Man. I think it's, hard. it's bad enough buying clothing and shoes for my kids. I mean, they grow like weeds. Are you, how do you keep up with that? What do you even wear? See, uh, all right. The reason why I'm making such a joke out of this is because it's such a joke of a doctrine. It's such a joke. But you know what I've noticed? Is that the people who want to point to, oh, the Nephilim, this, the Nephilim, oh, look at the book of Enoch, says all this, they don't point that out. The real crazy ones will. Because they'll say, when, when, the, when the spies were went to spy out the land and they come back and they say, well, we were as grasshoppers in their sight. They say, see? That's because they were so big. I mean, we're 11,000 feet tall. Yeah, they're going to look like grasshoppers. <sighs> but the book of Enoch then actually says that this is, that's basically the reason why God sends a flood. It's because of these hybrids, because of these devils. But the Bible actually says the wickedness of men. It's not the wickedness of hybrids. It's not the wickedness of Nephilim. It's the wickedness of men. And then what do you do with the giants that appear like David and Goliath? That's after the flood. God, apparently God didn't do a very good job of wiping out those giants when he sent that flood if there's still giants after the flood. frustrating and it's actually pretty angering that, that people could be so ignorant and, and just be so lifted up in pride that they'll fall into this nonsense because it is nonsensical. It's the same type of the people that fall into this flat earth nonsense. And see, people like this that, that believe these just 
ridiculous things about the Bible actually bring a bad name on Christianity and the Bible. They're turning it into a big joke. What, because what they believe is a joke, but what they believe isn't in the Bible. And these people that want to say, oh, the earth is flat, you're making a mockery and a joke out of God's creation. And they build up these straw men and say, see, look, NASA lied about this picture. It's digitally created. So that just means the earth's flat. No. Or they'll, they'll give you this false dichotomy of, of, oh, well, you don't believe the earth's flat? Oh, so you believe in evolution? No. No, we don't. We believe the Bible. But all of your stupid proofs and verses that you think prove your flat earth do nothing of the sort. But the simple ones will be persuaded by that. When they have these videos, there's 420 verses that say that the Bible, that the, that the earth's flat. And the simple ones will be like, oh, wow, that, I mean, if there's that much evidence for it, then it must be flat. Or, wow, then the Bible must be really stupid, one or the other. Here's some of the references. I don't want to go too far into this, but before, before we get into the references, the reason why I'm bringing up this thing about the flat earth is because we're actually in a passage that, for me, see, I question not the flat earth. A long time ago, I questioned what's known as geocentricity. If you're not familiar with that, that just means that the earth is at the center of things instead of the sun. So we have a heliocentric model as given to us by science and by a lot of people, right? Believe that the, the, the sun is kind of at the center of our solar system. The planets revolve around the sun, right? I mean, you all know that model. That's called the heliocentric because the helio means sun, okay? Geocentric model means that the earth is, is at the center and that the planets and the sun and the moon and everything revolve around the earth. Now that... I don't believe that. I don't subscribe to that. But that makes more sense to me than the flat earth does. And I think the geocentricity is just kind of the gateway drug to flat earth. Because they take the, the arguments of geocentricity and just put it on steroids. But what they do, and the reason why geocentricity has any type of validation at all, at least you have people who are like physicists or scientists that will try to give you alternate models of how things could work. Like mathematically, with what we see and observe in the sky, with the sun, with the moon, with the stars, with the way everything rotates and shifts, you, you could actually come up with a model. And then someone, people have built models of, well, if the earth is stationary. Because what, there are, what their argument is, is saying that, well, think about if you're standing on a train and you're standing there and you see it looks like the ground's moving. Right? You stand on the back of a train and the train's moving and it looks like the ground is moving under your feet. Right? It's what it looks like. Because you're in a closed environment. How do you really tell which is moving? Is it the ground moving or is it what you're on moving? Right? So, and I don't want to get too deep into this, but that's what they say is that, well, we can't really tell if the earth is moving or if the sun is moving. Right? If the earth is stationary or the sun is stationary because we're on the earth, so, so it's, it's, you can't do anything to determine one or the other, is what they would say. And um, then they come up with these other models and stuff, and they say, okay, well, whatever. Oh, at the end of the day, it, it kind of ends up just being a foolish question overall, but they, but they, you know, they get into it that way. And, and I, I remember looking into that and trying to figure it out. And what they'll do is they'll use verses like this, like in Joshua, where it says, sun stands still. So what they do is say, well, he's, he's ascribing the motion to the sun. And say, well, we we'll take the Bible literally, right? Yeah, we take the Bible literally. So if he says sun stands still, then the sun must have been moving. So in order for the sun to not move, and we see that the earth, you know, there's other Bible verses that says, well, the earth doesn't move and this stuff, so the earth is, it must be stationary. Then, well, how could it, if the Bible says that the earth doesn't move, then how can we say it's traveling around the sun? Because it's moving then, right? Or how can we say it's spinning? So these are the arguments for the geocentric model. And, and a lot of those same arguments will come to flat earth. But see, the problem is, at least with the flat earth, that doesn't prove that it's flat, first and foremost. But second of all, this is all written in our perspective to give us understanding of what things mean. And very, very simply, when we look at this passage, let's look at, at what the verse actually says. Look in verse number 12, Joshua 10. Then spake Joshua to the Lord, because what they like to do is say, oh, well, we believe the Bible is literal, and you must not be believing it's literal if you think that the earth moves around the sun. 
But let's take that same argument and just apply it consistently. If you say, well, if you're, if you're going to have to say that that's not literal then, because we, you know, if, to think that the earth could possibly move around the sun. Well, let's, let's look at the verse. Then spake Joshua the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon. Was the, does the sun have legs? Is the sun standing on Gibeon, on the city? Well, it says there, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon. Do you see how you could get really nonsensical when you read Scripture? Well, we believe it literally, don't you? Oh, well, then you're just going to make the Bible say whatever you want and say, no, no, we use common sense because we speak language and we understand how language works. And when you're getting a point across, with the word, it's not, it's not saying it's not literal, but it's using phrases and terms to, to get the understanding. No one has a problem understanding what it means when he says, Sun, stand now still, and it's standing upon Gibeon because it's shining its light upon Gibeon. And, and nothing's moving, it's stationary. Because when we look at the sun, we see a sunrise and a sunset. And that's what it looks like to us. It's inconsequential whether it's because the earth is rotating or the sun is moving. It doesn't matter. We see a sunrise and a sunset. And that's the way we understand it. And if you're going to communicate to anybody, anyone, anything, you're going to use those types of, of terms. Nobody walks around saying, oh, our earth rotation is nearing the <laughs> point where the sun is no longer visible. Say, it's a sunset. Because that's what everyone uses and, and understands it to be. And he says, And thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. Was the moon in the valley of Ajalon? Was the moon just sitting in the valley? No. It's just above where it was located, right? So we don't get too caught up in this, this hyper-literal type of just nipping. And this is what I was trying to get to, I think a week or two ago, on just, just zooming in and kind of getting too, too focused, too deep on some of these words where you just, you're not seeing the forest for the trees because you're so focused in on a tree, you don't actually see the big picture. You don't see what it's talking about. Watch out for that. But um, let's see, where am I at with time? Because I'm not going to bore you with too much of this flat earth stuff. It is nonsense. I brought, I, I printed out a list of things, but I think I'm kind of going a little bit too, yeah, we're going too late tonight. I'm not going to get into all this stuff. I have a whole list of things I was going to get into. That's, that'll be a sermon for another day. Let's, uh, let's close up the rest of this chapter here. Joshua chapter 10. Verse number 14, the Bible says, And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. What, a, what an awesome event. Again, just, just how cool is that? God listened to Joshua, and he, just, he listened to the voice of a man and, and brought this awesome miracle and victory. And Joshua returned and all Israel with him unto the camp to Gilgal. But these five kings fled and hid themselves in a cave at Makeda, and it was told Joshua, saying, The five kings are found hidden in a cave in Makeda. And Joshua said, Roll great stones upon the mouth of the cave and set men by it for to keep it. So he's saying, All right, we've got, we still got to go and keep defeating this enemy. Put a, roll a stone over here so they can't get out and then set up some men just to make sure that they don't escape. We're going to keep them here and everyone else is going to go. They continue to fight the battle and, and these people are fleeing and trying to get back to their cities and seek refuge. So when they're done destroying as many of them as they can, because some of them end up getting away, then they come back to the cave. And it says here in verse number, jump down to verse number 22, it says, Then said Joshua, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings unto me out of the cave. And they did so and brought forth those five kings out unto him, or unto him out of the cave, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, and the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And it came to pass when they brought out those kings unto Joshua that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto the captains of the men of war which went with them, Come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet upon the necks of them. And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage, for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. And, and again, what a great event that would be They've got these, these kings, kings of nations, that might put a little bit of fear into these soldiers. 
because, hey, they're great men. We're men of renown. They're these great kings. And he's saying, you know what? Put your foot on their neck. You see how low they are? And that God's given you dominion over them. He so said, God's going to do that to all of your enemies. And just giving them more courage. Just see, look, this is the position that God, God's going to fight for you. God's given us this victory. And, and just remember this with, with your foot on the back of their neck that, that none of these wicked people are going to be able to stand before the Lord. So God's going to deliver all of them in your hand. We ought to be able to fight our spiritual fight with that same type of attitude or mentality. Who are these people anyways? Who are these wicked workers of iniquity? You don't need to be scared of them. Are we wise? We're going to fight. And you dead sure have no reason to fear. Not at all. Don't let them trick you into being afraid. Because they're going to try to make themselves as scary as possible. They're going to do whatever they can to get you to stop fighting. Because if you stop fighting, how are you ever going to win? We're in a spiritual fight. We need to keep fighting. And if you get afraid, then you're going to quit the battle. Joshua then continues to fight. So he, he, he kills these guys. He puts them up as a curse, hangs them on the tree till the evening because they're cursed people, cursed to the Lord. And then, and then, you know, rolls a bunch of heaps of stones over them and then continues to fight. And then what he does is he goes back and it says, uh, he, he basically goes, and we're not going to read, there's a lot of verses here, but it's all basically just saying that it lists off every single, so like the king of, um, you know, of Eglon, of Jarmuth, of Hebron, of Jerusalem, of Lachish, he goes to all of these places then, to those cities, and then destroys all of them and their new king that they set up because their kings have already been killed, and they just, he, he just destroys each one round about. And then he finally gets to come back home. Verse number um, 40. Jump down to verse number 40. It says, So Joshua smote all the country of the hills and of the south and of the vale and of the springs and all their kings. He left none remaining, but utterly destroyed all that breathed as the Lord God of Israel commanded. And Joshua smote them from Kadesh Barnea, even unto Geza, and all the country of Goshen, even unto Gibeon. And all these kings and their land did Joshua take at one time because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. And Joshua returned and all Israel with him under the camp to Gilgal. So he fought all of those battles before finally just going back to their camp. It's a long time of being in a, in a battle campaign and just fighting battle after battle after battle after battle and taking city after city after city after city and destroying everybody and just, just keep working hard before he finally got some rest. That can't have been easy for them to do. The spiritual life, being right with God and, and being in God's will is not going to be easy. But we can't faint. There is a rest coming. Our lives ultimately really aren't that long. Let's keep up the fight and not back down. Because, and, then, and then we could enter into the rest of our Lord. And he could say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what it's about. And we need to keep that focus right so we don't just, just get tired and fed up and quit the race before it's ended. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all these great stories in the scripture. Dear Lord, I pray that you please just keep us wise. Help us to also be kept humble. God, help us in this, in this spiritual fight, fight that we're engaging. Help us to be strong. Help us have courage. Lord, lift our spirits. Help us to encourage one another in this church. Help us to continue to win souls to Christ and, and just not to allow the enemy to, to back us down, but that we would just, just continue to preach and, uh, and be bold with your words. 
God, we love you, and we just ask for you to, to help build our church, bring other soldiers here that, that will help us engage in the battle. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.